Well, good morning and happy Father's Day again. So glad that you've chosen to come and spend your Father's Day with us. Let me ask the dads in the room, how many of you love being a dad? Come on, man. It, isn't it awesome? Isn't it awesome? Uh, how many of you like being a dad? Right? That's a different question, isn't it? That's a different question. Uh, man, I, I tell you, it, I love being a dad. I wear many hats. Uh, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a husband of Jess. I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm a friend. I'm a son. I'm all kinds of things. But one of my favorite hats to wear is Father to my three kiddos. I wanna, I, I'm the one with the microphone today, so I'm going to brag on my kids just for a little bit. Uh, so I want to show you a couple pictures of my kids and kind of set the stage where we're going today. This is a picture of my oldest. Her name is Micah. Uh, she turned seven in December on the 23rd. So we do like this half birthday thing. So we just did her birthday this last weekend. It was awesome. And here's what's crazy about her, man. She's so wicked smart. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't mean that in the sense of, oh, my kid is so smart. I mean, like, in the sense, like, it sometimes creeps me out how smart she is when it comes to solving problems and deductive reasoning. Like, we, we can almost never pull anything over on her. Like, try to surprise her, not going to happen. Um, because she always figures things out. And what's crazy is, is that not only is she wicked smart and problem solving, it's, it's concerning when that gets partnered together with how sneaky she is. I mean, she is always kind of, you know, trying to work something to her advantage, trying to get her way. And, and, and it, 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 it freaks me out sometimes. I'll be honest with you. There's times where I'm like, I'm going to have to bail her out at some point. <laughs> she's going she's gonna to try to be sneaky and it's not going to happen. But when I ask her, I say, hey, Micah, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she goes, I want to be a police officer. Whew. All right, right side of the law. There we go. <laughs> you know. We all go, Michael, why do you want to be a police officer? She goes, because I love donuts. <laughs> now, to any police officers in the room, Clark, I know you're in here somewhere. Uh, here's the deal. I have never told her that. She just figured that out. And listen, if the shoe fits, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I like to describe Micah, like if she were to walk into a room of, of, of a bunch of people, like she's just going to walk in with this understanding that she's just the smartest person in the room. And what's scary in some ways, she might actually be the smartest person in the room. This is my middle. Uh, his name is Carson. He's my wild man. Uh, man, love this dude. Uh, not at all what I thought being a father to a son was going to be. Uh, when he was young, I was like, oh, get the footballs and the basketballs and all this stuff. And he was like, yeah. I want to read. I want to art. <laughs> Obviously, I don't art. Uh, <laughs> but right, like he, he loves doing those kinds of things. But man, I love it. He's such a cool kid. Matter of fact, uh, this week, he learned to ride his bicycle without training wheels. Big deal in our house. I was super proud, right? I was also a little heartbroken because it was like, boom, there's another milestone. Just phew, gone. <sighs> Slow down. I describe Carson like this. When Carson walks into a room, man, he just loves everybody and everybody loves him. Seriously. Even when he was a kid, like at 18 months old, I can remember coming home from work and the kid just sees the world through this lens of joy. I'm like, man, I wish I had as much joy as he does. And he's the most emotionally intelligent human I've ever known. I can remember when he was like three years old. I came home from work. I'm sitting down with him and he grabs me by the face. He goes, Daddy, you happy? And in that moment, I was like, you know what? It doesn't matter if I was or wasn't because I am now. You know what I mean? Like the kid is just like, he just cares for people. I love him so much. We were playing, we had him playing soccer. And, uh, you know, the kids are chasing the ball around. My kids are going, this is so much fun. Yeah, everybody's having fun. I'm like, dude, chase the ball. Okay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Love the kid. He's so squirrely. And this is my baby boy. This is my baby boy. Gunner. Now, this is, my, this is my son that's all about, like, sports. Like, he's three years old and already, like, kicking soccer balls around and football and basketball. Like, he's just, he's just all about it. I describe Gunner like this, that when Gunner walks into a room, it's just a matter of time until everybody in the room understands that we now belong to him. He's the boss. And I don't know if that's because that's just he's the youngest and a baby thing and he's just trying to get his way. But man, he, he, you belong to me. It's just how it works. And whatever you have, you eat what you eating. That's mine. Let me have a bite. You know what I'm saying? And what's, what's, it, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny in the moment. He, he's like, he knows no fear. 
And about three or four months ago, you can see he's missing a tooth. Most three-year-olds aren't missing a tooth, um, but he is. Uh, he was climbing on the furniture. You know that step, like right in front of your fireplace? Some of you guys have that. He was climbing on the furniture, and like, boom, face planted right into it. I mean, his blood everywhere, you know, it was awful. My daughter, Micah, was there, and she was like, oh, oh, it's awful, there's so much blood. You know, and so we're like getting it taken care of and taking him to the dentist and like, okay, you know, one of the other teeth was pushed back, and so they had to like yank that dude back and hoping he didn't lose both of his front teeth. Anyway, we get back, and, and Micah's like, Carson, it's going to be okay. The tooth fairy's coming. <laughs> we looked for a couple of hours to try to find that tooth. We never found it. Which means only one thing. I'm like, Tooth Fairy doesn't love you that much. You know, it's just not, it's just not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. You know, here's the deal, we love dads. I think all of us love, love being dads, but I, I think if we could be just really, really honest with each other, I'll be honest with you, that we may all love, we may love being a dad, but there are times when we don't like being a dad. Right, so the moments this last week when my son learned to ride his bike, I mean, I was like, yes, yeah, that's my boy. So proud of you, dude. Nailed it, crushed it, awesome. Five minutes later, I walk in the house. I had been mowing the yards. I've been outside for like an hour, then did the, you know, did the whole bike without training wheels thing. And I walk into the house and I see on the floor of the kitchen in the house, a glass pitcher. And sitting on, the glass pitcher sitting on top of a puddle of orange juice that used to be in the glass pitcher. I don't know how long it's been there. Like, I'm like, how long does it take orange juice to like eat away the, the, the stain on the floor and like mess up the wood? I don't, I don't know. I turn to my left and like the refrigerator door is open and there's a chair in front of it. What is happening? In five minutes, I was like, yeah, to, hey, y'all kids, get in here. I said, hey, what happened here? The older two immediately, like I hardly got out of my, Gunner did that. <laughs> Gunner comes trailing in, which anytime, you know, they go, oh, I want to do that, me too. Gunner always goes, me free. And he comes in and I, and I, I said, Gunner, did you do this? He goes, oh yeah, I did that. <laughs> I'm like, bro just, I just want to mow the yard, okay? Just want to mow the yard, not have to worry about stuff breaking and, and, and messes being made. But here's the deal. As a parent, as a father, we have this incredible responsibility. And God has entrusted these small tyrants to us to raise and transform from tyrants to being these productive members of society that know and love Jesus. And it's hard. And so I, would, I just want to bring a message to you dads today that, listen, I, I'm right there in the thick of it. My list, seven, five, and three, that's where I am. I want to bring a message today that I hope will be encouraging to you and I hope will be motivating to you. And if you are a father of a father or, or mother, then I want to invite you to lean in because I, God's given me some things to share with you as well. I want to share a message with you today that I've titled, Stir Them Up. Because our job ultimately as parents is, is to, to take the things that God has wired in them and put in them and stir it up so that, so that good can come out of it. Because if we don't do our job to stir up the right stuff, then what happens is, is the world's going to come along and the world doesn't care about our kids as much as we do and they'll stir them up to do all kinds of stupid stuff. But it's our job to stir them up and to stir what God has put in them so, so things can get activated so that they can, they can be and become all that God wants them to be and become. We're going to be in our Bibles today in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. We use them every time we get together on a Sunday morning. If you're, if you, if you're there, you can either you know, turn it on or, or open it up, whatever it is. If not, we got the verses on the screen. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 4. If you're there, let me hear you say pop. 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 There we go. It says this, and you fathers... Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, I just felt like I could just stop right there and go, oh, I'm so encouraged. And you all would go like, yeah. I'm, don't provoke your kids to wrath. Okay. We'll work on that. Because here's the deal. Here, right, like I'm already looking forward to the days that I can embarrass my kids. 
My kids are too young right now for that. I test it out every once in a while with Micah, and she's still too young. But I, I'm already plotting for the things that I can do someday to embarrass my kids. Just, you know, I know the Bible says vengeance is mine. I will repay, thus says the Lord. But there are just certain things that I just want to be like, oh, your day's coming. You just wait. Right? So, so, so there will be a day where we like embarrass our kids. And there will be a day where, where your kid is going to tell you, if they've not told you this yet, it's coming. Okay? I spent 11 years as a youth pastor. And I would have parents come up to me sometimes and go, you won't believe what my kid said about me this weekend. I'm like, oh, no, I'm pretty sure I can. I'm pretty sure this is you know, kind of my world. Here's what you won't believe. You won't believe what your kid said to me about you last week. That's what you won't believe. But I'm pretty sure I can believe what they said to you. But to go ahead and tell them what they did. They, they came up to me and they said, Dad, you suck the fun out of everything. You shouldn't ruin my life. And depending on the day, those may be true words. Let's just be honest. But depending on the day, you may be trying to suck the fun out of something. And you may be trying to ruin their life to bring them down to size. Those things happen. But here's, here's what I know about you. I know that you as a dad do not set as your life goals to go, you know what? Embarrassed? That's going to happen. Frustrated? Yeah, that's going to happen. But I want to pole vault past embarrassed, past and frustrated, all the way to the point of wrath. That's my goal. Matter of fact, y'all just put that on my tombstone. Here lies a dad who provoked his kids, all cast big letters, wrath. Nobody starts with that goal. Yet the Bible says, hey, listen, don't provoke your kids to wrath. Why would he say, why would God say, hey, don't provoke your kids to wrath when none of us have the goal of doing that? Because I've come to learn that there are the things that we do that provoke our kids to wrath are not often the intentional things that we do. They are the unintentional things that we do that provoke our kids to wrath. Things like being inconsistent with our discipline. When we're inconsistent with our discipline, we create this moving target and our kids never know what the right thing to do is. We tell them do right and don't do wrong. And they're like, okay, would you hold it still long enough so I know what the difference is? We provoke our kids to wrath when we're not intentional, intentional about creating and maintaining harmony in your home. That we allow the dynamics and the conflict between mom and dad to, to spill over to the kids and we allow the stress of work and the stress of life and the stress of relationships and the stress of finances and the stress of all these things to come into the house and, and we don't protect the harmony and the unity of the home. Because when we don't protect harmony, it creates disunity and disunity creates chaos and chaos is never a good breeding ground for children. It's just not. We we provoke our children to wrath when we are very unintentional with what we say and what we do that clearly articulates that one of my kids is my favorite and the rest of y'all don't matter as much as that one does. And none of us do that intentionally. Everyone says you're not has, supposed to have favorites, right? Like there's always going to be a certain kid that, that shares an interest or a wiring or a personality like you do. There's going to be a natural bond or connection there. But when you unintentionally just float to that, then what you are unintentionally saying to your other children is, is ha, good luck, you'll never be as good as this one, and I'll never love you as much as I love them. You see, that provokes our kids to wrath. And so if, if the goal is not to provoke our kids to wrath, then what is the goal? Well, I want to share with you a verse found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, and verse 24. It says this, and let us consider one another in order to, what's that word? Stir up love and good works. Now, it's important that we understand the immediate context of this is that he's, he's speaking to when, when believers and Christians come together and do church stuff. Right? So when you get together in your small group and you get together in your church, well, you should consider one another so that you can stir up one another. He's talking about how we approach relationships. And so because what's in view is how we approach relationships, I believe that this is also a really good rule of thumb when it comes to what we do as dads. 
that we need to consider one another, meaning our kids, we need to consider our kids so that we can stir up love and good works. Now, let me ask you this question just by show of hands. How many of you would say, I would love it when it's all said and done with, whenever the finish line is reached as being a parent, which I don't really know when that happens. It's not when they go to college. It's not when they get married because, hello, you're still a parent, okay? So maybe it's right before you, you know, die, right? That you finally are done and crossing the finish line as a parent. How many of you would love to say, man, you know what? I would love my kids to love people well, to, to take care of people, to, to not be selfish and, and self-centered and, and, and conceited and, and, to, and to do good to people and to serve them and to, and to make the world around them a better place because they love people and because they did good works. How many of you would say, man, that sounds pretty good. Like if I could do that, high five to me. Anybody feel, feel that way? Maybe four of us. Okay, the rest of you, I don't know what your goals are. All right, but I'm praying for you as parents. Right, so listen, at the end of the day, like, like, like that's something that describes kind of what we want. Ultimately, we don't want them to just be good and do good things. We ultimately, we should want them to also be godly. And so I want to share with you what I believe four things that we can do as dads to be intentional because, because it's not the intentional things that we do that provoke our kids to wrath. It's the unintentional things. And it's the intentional things that we do, if we do them right, can stir up love and good works in our kids. And so I want to share those with you today. The first thing that we've got to do is we have to speak life to our kids. We have to speak life. Words matter. And you know that. If you were to think back to your childhood, you can probably think of certain times where you just knew, man, you had made your mom or your dad or whoever your parental type figure was, you just made them so proud. And they looked at you, I'm so proud of you. You're so awesome. I love you so much. I care about you. But I bet you can also remember two or three or five or ten times where they said something that hurt you was critical towards you or harmful towards you or hurtful towards you. I know my mom and dad said all kinds of, of good things to me, but I can remember two or three things specifically, vividly, that they said that cut so deep that at 33 years old, I still remember it. I'm not marked by it like I used to be, but I remember it. You see, sociologists tell us that our negative words have such much, they have such more staying power than our positive words. Matter of fact, they've done studies on this and they found that for every, every one negative or critical thing that is said to you, it takes five positive things that is said to or about you to counterbalance just that one thing. That carries a lot of weight for us as dads. Because sometimes, we can be really unintentional and, and say critical things and be very unintentional and not make sure that we are speaking life to our kids. But we as dads, we have to understand that part of the job is we've got to, we, in order to stir our kids up well, we've got to speak life into them because the world is going to speak a lot of things into them and it's not the things that are going to speak life that's going to lead them to Jesus. That's our job. That's our job. It's our responsibility to do that. So what does that look like? Well, I'm convinced that if you are a father of boys, that there are certain things that every single boy needs to hear. And if you were to think back to your childhood, maybe you did or didn't have a great relationship with your father. And if you didn't have a great relationship with your father, imagine how these words would have made an impact on you if you heard them regularly. I love you. I'm proud of you. Man, you're so strong. Man, you're so brave, man. You're, you're so brave. You just went into that with no fear. Man, good job, man. I care about you. You see, our sons need to hear those things. If you're a father of daughters, our daughters need to hear certain things. And some of it's similar, but some of it's a little bit different. All of our daughters need to hear consistently, I love you, sweetheart. Daddy loves you. I'm so proud of you. You are so beautiful. Next to your mama, you're my favorite, or if you have multiple daughters, you're my favorite girls in the world. Why is this so critical? Because here's what we're doing, men. We are training our sons how to be good and godly fathers and, and husbands, and we are training our daughters what to look for in a good and godly husband. 
We establish the filter. And so if we don't speak life into them, then they're going to grow up with a twisted view of things. And not only that, not only are we modeling what a good and godly husband is and, and father is and looks like, they see God through us. And the Bible says that, that God is a, is a perfect God. He's a perfect father. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's the father of lights of which there's no variation or shadow of turning. Like if that is our God and I'm super screwed up compared to that, how do I make sure that, that my kids see the best of God in me? And listen, if you are a father to a father or a mother, there are some things that you need to be speaking to them. You need to speak some encouragement to them. You need to be, remember maybe what it was like to be in those days with, 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 with young kids, with toddlers, with, with school age, elementary, high school age, college age kids, and all the pressures and all the things that you're facing. You need somebody, you needed somebody to speak encouragement into you and you get to be that person for your son or your daughter who is now a father or a mother. As a father to a, a father or a mother, man, you need to speak life by bringing levity to certain situations. Man, there are certain things I've called my mom or my dad about, and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, insert story. It, it feels so big, and it feels so embarrassing, and oh my gosh, people saw it, and, and my mom and my dad sometimes, just, they'll just start chuckling. They'll be like, well, it's okay. What are they doing? They're bringing levity to a situation. Not only are they bringing levity, they're bringing perspective. Hey, this is only going to last for so long. It's only going to be acceptable, and I use that word loosely, for your sons to run out buck naked in the neighborhood you just moved into wearing nothing but snow boots waving at people. That's only acceptable for so long. So yes, it's embarrassing. Laugh about it. It's okay. Hey, can I tell you something? One of the best things, by the way, young parents, your moment's coming in about eight seconds. If you are a father to a father or a mother, one of the best and most encouraging things you can say is, hey, listen, why don't we take the kids and y'all go out on a date? That, that, that's your moment right there. You missed it. Why? Because you need to remember it's hard. And moms and dads need space to decompress. And sometimes I need space from all of the hungry mouths and butts that need to be wiped and homework that needs to be done and chores that need to be finished and messes that need to be cleaned up and, and, and conversations and big talks that you need to have with your middle schooler and high schooler and, and chasing them all around the baseball circuit, football circuit, basketball circuit, dance circuit, insert whatever circuit, that sometimes they just need a little bit of space to go, hey, at the end of the day, baby, it's me and you and you and me and we got this. One young parent is excited about that. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you, what does this look like for me? One of the things that I try to, I don't always get this right, but one of the things that I try to do every night when I put my kids to bed, I you know, go through the whole routine, read a book, bath time, all that stuff. They're laying in bed, and I, and I pray with them, and I ask them, hey, how can I pray for you? What am I doing? I'm trying to model what it looks like to follow Jesus. We pray in this house. And nothing that you have to pray about is too small for God. If it's, if it's big enough for you to worry about it, then it's big enough to pray about. And so I'm trying to model that to my kids. And the second thing that I do after I pray for them, whatever it is that they say, I will pray for it. And then I'll, and then I'll tell them. I try to do my best every night for them to hear one thing from my mouth, making eye contact with them that's telling them something that I love about them, something I like about them, something that I appreciate about them, or something that I'm proud of them for. Why am I doing that? Because I want them to know, regardless of how good the day or how bad the day was, regardless of how many times they got in trouble or how many times they didn't get in trouble, the last thing I want rolling through their sweet little minds and their little hearts as they close their eyes and drift off to sleep is my daddy loves me, likes me, appreciates me, and is proud of me for something. It doesn't matter what happened. I know my daddy cares about me. Because it matters. We've got to speak life. We have to do that very intentionally. Listen, I want to challenge you as parents. It doesn't matter if you're parents of older kids or younger kids. I want to challenge you. The next time you have a conversation with your kids, look for an opportunity to say, hey, do you know that your daddy loves you? And assuming they answer with saying yes, then I want you to ask them another question. I did this a few months ago and was blown away. What is it that daddy says or does that lets you know that he loves you? 
doesn't matter if your kids are little like mine or big like me. What they say to answer that question is going to be either encouraging or insightful for you. Because as we grow, the, what we need changes, and what, what we receive changes, and what, what, what resonates with us changes. And if you don't ask that question, then, then you won't know how to double down on the things that express and, and, and show your love and affection for your children. So I want to challenge you. Ask that question. So the first thing we have to do is we have to speak life. Second thing we have to do, hey, we got to treat mama well. Amen, ladies? Now, this gets really complicated, particularly if you're not married to your children's mom. And so I want to start off. If you're married to your kid's mama, you need to treat mama well. Why? Well, I said it earlier, because you're modeling what it looks like to be a godly husband. You're showing them what it is. You're setting the standard for either who your son needs to be or who your daughter needs to be looking for. So just ask yourself the question, do you want your daughter to have to deal with you through 60 years of marriage? And if you would smack you, if your daughter was married to you, that's a good indication. Oh, I should probably make a couple changes. I think it's funny that only ladies laughed right there. <laughs> Here's the deal. If you're married to their mama, hey, you need to love her well. You need to serve her. You need to, you need to do something. You need to make sacrifices for her. You need to go out of your way. Sometimes it doesn't always require that you make the big sacrifice that hurts. Sometimes it's just the little things along the way that just let your wife know, man, he's still pursuing me. I remember when we were dating. Where do you want to go, baby? Uh, I don't know, like barbecue. Well, I was thinking like Panera. Baby girl, I'll go to Panera all day with you. I don't care if I'm going to pay $30 for half a meal. I will go. Let's go, baby. Right? <laughs> Y'all know it's true. Right? Like, make those little sacrifices that let her know you're still, you're still laying it down so that she knows that you're still chasing after her. You know what you need to do? You need to do the dishes sometimes. You need to take out the trash sometimes. You need to do the floor sometimes. You, hey, fellas, can I just tell you something? Every once in a while, your fingers ain't going to break if you got to fold the laundry. That hurt because I just preached to myself on that one. I didn't say that in the first service. Thank you, Lord. All right. Duly noted. Hey, listen, you know what your kids need to see? They need to see you giving some non-sexual affection. Let me repeat that. Non-sexual. For the hearing impaired, non-sexual affection to your bride. Why? Because they need to know, you know what? We love each other. I'm madly in love with your, with your mama. And I'm just as hot after her as I was when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, when I was in college. When I first laid eyes on her, I was like, hello, who that is? I got to go. <laughs> right? Like, you, your kids need to see that. He said, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not married to my kid's mama. Okay, that's fine. Listen to me. This is still critical. Here's why. Because that woman is still their mama, regardless of whether or not she's still with you. And because she's still their mama, God has appointed her to a position of significant influence in their life. And when you speak against her, you are degrading her credibility to lead and parent your children. So you need to be careful what you say. If you got a vent, you go find a safe place to do it where they can't hear you. And let it be that when, you, when something comes out of your mouth about her, make it positive. Speak to the good attributes that you see in her. Regardless of where things are now, there was once a time where you were attracted to her. There was something about her that drew you to her, and it was more than just the rocking body because that only lasts for so long. You've got to have, what are the things that drew you to her as a person? Compliment her to your children. Let your children hear you say those things positively about her when she's in the room. And who knows, maybe the co-parenting thing will get a little bit easier when she begins to realize that you don't hate everything about her. We got to treat mama well. Second thing we got, or the third thing we got to do is we got to invest 
time. Now, when I talk to most guys about investment, we start talking about finances. We start talking about how much, you know, what we're doing to get our savings account right or how freaked out we are that, you know, savings account isn't right, what we're doing with our 401k in retirement or what, you know, what we're not doing for 401k in retirement, right? Like we, we talk about all of those things. But one of the things that we rarely ever talk about when it comes to investment is time. Can I tell you something? Your kids will love the presents. Your kids will love the gifts and they'll, they'll love the vacations and they'll love the experiences. But can I tell you something? Your kids need the most value, valuable commodity you can ever invest and it is your time. And man, I, this is the one that I screw up. This is the one that I oft, too often get wrong. It happened just this week. Same night of the bicycle thing and the OJ thing, before any of that happened, I came from work. It was a long day of work. I sat down on the couch and, and the kids are watching something. Jess had to go to rehearsal. And I, I sat down, you know, just kind of getting lost in the scroll a little bit. Just like, I just don't want to think about something, you know, like just mindless, brainless. Maybe there's something funny. Probably isn't. And, and I saw Carson come up, and he says, hey, Daddy. And I looked up at him, a big old smile. I was like, hey, bud, how are you? And he goes, good. Hey, Dad, I was wondering, and he kind of like roams around as he's talking like this. I was wondering, I wonder where the tickle monster has been today. I don't know, buddy. I gotta go mow the yard now. I didn't realize it. Changed my clothes, started mowing the yard, listened to my music, like a bolt of lightning. Oh snap, I missed it. I missed the moment. And it's a moment that's never going to come back. There's only so long my five-year-old is going to care about the Tickle Monster. And what hurts the most is, is that what I read on social media, I cared for less than half a second after I got done reading it. You see, here's what I'm learning from parents who are older, who have older kids, that if I want my kids to make sacrifices in their calendar to spend time with me then, I need to be making sacrifices in my calendar to spend time with them now. Let me just speak to young dads for just a second. Listen, I get it. I know sometimes that, that, that life is hard and difficult and, and, and you're working and you're trying to build your career and, and you're, you know, you're probably taking a hard job and you're doing the hard thing so that you can try to get to the next thing that might be a little bit better, set your family up a little bit better, whatever the case may be. And so you're busting in at work and, and you're coming home and because, you know, you got little kids at home and they're always, meh, 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 feed me, feed me, feed me. What's next? What's next? What's next? And mama's dealing with that either because she's staying at home or she's coming home from work and she's dealing with it as well. And, you know, now that creates all kinds of tension between you and mama because listen, the sparks ain't flying between nobody when the kids are like, mam, 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 mam. and you're coming home and you're you're carrying the weight of the pressure of work and the pressure of finances and the pressure of my marriage isn't great and the pressure of my parents and the pressure of relationships and the pressure of expectation and the pressure of disappointment because I'm not where I wanted to be at this stage of life and the pressure of all these things and you carry that home and sometimes all you want to do is disconnect and disengage and go somewhere where nobody needs you for just a little bit and I'm not trying to say that you don't need that from time to time because you do but listen to me carefully I our sons and daughters will only want to sit in our lap, snuggle with us, play Tickle Monster, read a book for so long. And when it's gone, it's gone. And it's never, ever, ever, ever coming back. And we need to invest our time in our kids. And I'm preaching to myself. I hate that my actions tell my kids from time to time that this stupid stuff on social media is more important than spending time with you right now, buddy. Take a number. Amen. 
If I want my kids at 15 and 25 and 35 and 45 to want to care about me, then my actions better tell them when they're five and six and seven that I care about them. And listen, dads, I get it. It's hard, but we got to do it. We've got to do it. We've got to invest our time in our kids. Wish I could learn this from my kids. Last Saturday, I was reading my devotions outside, and Jessica had finished a little bit before me and gone in and started making breakfast, and I heard Carson go, I want to help make orange juice. I hear Jessica go, okay, buddy. Be a few minutes. He comes outside, sits with me. I finish up reading. We just start talking. I don't, somehow we started talking about who's the boss of what and who, and he's like, well, Daddy, you're the boss of the house. I was like, well, kind of, yeah. You know, Mommy helps with that. Well, no, Mommy's the boss of the groceries, of which I'm very thankful, aren't you? And he's like, you know, Mike is the boss of this and Gunnar's the boss of this. What am I the boss of? I was like, buddy, you're the boss of your decisions. Like, that's your job. Your job is to make good decisions that honor Mommy and Daddy and treat other people well and, and, and that God would be happy with. About that time, Jessica goes, Carson, I'm making orange juice. He kind of didn't hear it. He was talking, you know, and, and about a minute later, Jessica, Carson, I'm making the orange juice now. Come on. And Carson goes, um, it's okay. I'm spending time with Daddy, and we're talking about stuff right now. And what would it mean to my kids if I go, um, that's not as important because I'm talking to my son right now. You see, this stuff in their world doesn't seem very big to us, but it's big to them. And fathers of fathers and mothers, we need to be reminded sometimes, not in a naggy way, not in a guilt trip way, but just in an encouraging, hey, what are you doing to spend time with your son or your daughter this week? The last thing we've got to do, the most important thing that we can do in any relationship as a parent, as a spouse, as a leader, we have to revere Jesus as Lord. Listen to me. Your kids will love the gifts you can give them, the stuff that you can wrap, and the places you can take them to see, and the experiences you can give them. But can I tell you something? The gift that they need the most is to see what it looks like to love and follow Jesus. And dads, that's not your wife's job, that's yours. Should you do it collectively? Sure. But it doesn't fall on her, it falls on us. You know, I would love for my kids, when they get old enough to process all of this, and for people to ask the question and say, hey, well, what's the most important thing in your daddy's life? I don't want them to say the church. I don't want them to say his phone. I don't want them to say golf. I don't want them to say being healthy or fitness or working out. You know what I don't want them to say? I want them to say the most important thing in my daddy's life is Jesus. Well, what's the second most important thing in your daddy's life? My mama. You see, we get so deluded in this idea that we have to make our kids the center of our world and the center of our marriage and the center of our life, and we come convinced that we've got to, we've got to make them and shape them to be who we, want, who we used to be or who we weren't. And so we force them and, and push them to be all of these kinds of things, and we should champion our kids, and we should challenge our kids to be their best, but we shouldn't make them become something that they're not. Listen, not every son that's born is going to be the next coming of, of Bo Jackson and stinking Peyton Manning. It's just not going to happen. We need to embrace the little boy that they are so that we can champion the man that God is becoming them, leading to them to become. And the same with our daughters. And so what our kids need is they don't need to be the center of our world. They won't care about playing third fiddle if they're playing third fiddle to Jesus and your, and your wife. They will care if they're playing third fiddle to work and hobby. We've got to revere Jesus as Lord. We've got to make him the boss. We need to let our kids catch us praying. We need to let our kids catch us reading our Bible. We need to let our kids catch us working through a hard thing and going to God in prayer saying, God, I need wisdom. We need to let our kids catch us in biblical community so they don't hear us say one thing and watch us do another. 
And when we do this, if we'll be serious about this, and what happens is, is we begin to actualize and realize the promises of God's word. When he said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. God knows there are days where you're at your wit's end and you don't have it. Whatever it is, patience, wisdom, encouragement, wise counsel. Uh, can I just be honest? Sometimes we don't have a give a darn to, to, to care enough about whatever it is that they're going through. There are days we don't have it. And God says, listen, I know that. Let me fill in what you don't have with what I have so that your kids don't pay for it. You come home and you don't have the patience. Instead of lashing out, go to God. God, I don't have patience right now. Help me to have the patience that you would have with my kids in this moment. Your kids start asking hard questions or want advice that you don't have the answers to. Hello. There are some questions you're like, whoo, okay. That is not in the manual. God says, come to me and pray for wisdom, and I'll give it to you liberally if you'll ask for it. Sometimes it's all so much that we just don't want to keep going. If you go to God and you pray to God for endurance, he'll give it to you. He says, my strength can be made perfect in your weakness. Dads, that applies to me, and it applies to you. And so if we don't, want to provoke our children to wrath, then we need to get really serious about stirring them up to love and good works. And this is what it looks like, that we speak life, that we treat mama well, that we invest our time, and that we revere Jesus as Lord. And here's, Dad, this is what happens. When, when we do this, then, then, then we begin to stir something up in their hearts and their lives and their souls that cause them to want to, to love people and to love others and to love God and, and to love you and to love your wife and to love your family. When we, when we do these things, then we stir that up. And not only that, we we stir up something in them and we activate something in them that says, listen, I don't want to just be lazy. I don't want to just be selfish. There will be seasons of that. That's called being a teenager. You got to kick them in the rear sometimes, not literally, but sometimes. And then, and, and you got to stir that stuff up. But when we do our part to stir that up, then, then we give them what they need. We, we activate the stuff that God has put inside of them that he's created them with to love him and to love others and, and to be a good person and to make an impact on the world but most importantly, we can stir up a love and affection for God so that more than being a good person and more than doing good things, they can be a godly person and do godly things. That's a big freaking job. But the Bible says, hey, church, when you guys get together, consider one another. Hey, listen, dads, can we be the type of dads in, in the type of church that doesn't just look around at each other and kind of sarcastically make fun of each other and, and kind of, you know, passively cut each other down? Hey, can we be the kind of dads that say, hey, listen, woo, this is hard. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to stir something up in you so that you can be activated so that when you go back home, you can stir your kids up. May we be the kind of church that doesn't, just, that doesn't just say things and doesn't just talk about things, but that we live this out and that we look to stir one another up so that we can do the loving things and the good things that our kids need from us, that apart from the Spirit of God and the encouragement from the church, we are no chance to be able to do it on our own. And hey, listen, in the midst of it all, as followers of Jesus, if you have a relationship with Jesus and you are a dad in this place, then we have an example. And we have a loving father who cares for us that modeled love, that modeled sacrifice. He says, you love because I first loved you. You ever wonder what God thinks sometimes when we're praying about all of our little things? I don't think he gets upset. I don't think he gets frustrated. I think that sometimes he wonders why we have such small faith. I think sometimes he wonders why we're still struggling with that thing when he's already given us victory. I think sometimes that he, 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 he's, he's trying to understand I've 
I've put everything you need around you, but you won't engage with the church and you won't engage in community and you won't engage with, with the word of God. I've given you the tools you need to do it. Hey, do, do, ha, ha, do it. Listen, dance. What we say and what we do mean the world to these little kids that we're raising. And if you're a father to a father or mother in this place, what you say and what you do means the world to the kids that you've already raised and sent out of your house. So let's stir one another up. Come on, let's, let's, let's stir each other, not, not unintentionally by, by, by not thinking about things, but intentionally, by intentionally thinking about and doing the types of things that stir our kids and stir our families and stir our church towards love and good works. So that when people say, hey, what the heck? Your family is so functional. That's so weird. Everything else is dysfunctional. Why is your family so functional? Uh, because God helps us. Because Jesus is leading us. Because as a dad, I'm doing my level best to stir them up. Let's bow our heads and pray today.